okay, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, uh, my name's Storm Bailey. I'm a philosopher here at Luther. I also teach in the Paideia program. Uh, and, uh, and I'm also on the board. Is that, is that what it's called? It is. I'm on the board uh, for the uh, Center for Ethics and Public Engagement. And uh, I, I'd like to just to, to start with thanks. First of all, thanks, uh, uh, thanks to you uh, for coming out to uh, continue this conversation. Um, and uh, thanks to the Center uh, for Ethics and Public Engagement uh, for, uh, for sponsoring this and uh, kind of putting it on. Uh, their mission, I suppose I should say our mission, I don't, I'm, I'm unsure about my status here, okay. <laughs> Uh, um, that, to extend conversation beyond the classroom, to examine assumptions, exchange ideas, and encourage responsible action in our world. That's what the Center for Ethics and Public Engagement is all about. And, uh, um, and, and after the, uh, uh, after the uh, distinguished, uh, distinguished lecture uh, this year, was about two weeks ago, maybe exactly two weeks ago, uh, Jonathan Haidt was here. And, uh, and I know that I was involved in a lot of conversations afterwards uh, with, uh, with people um, who, uh, with a lot of people who really appreciated a lot that Hyde had to say. And I was also involved in a lot of conversations with people who, were, who had some questions about it and some challenges to it. And my number one, I'm just telling you my reaction here, was I hope we can all talk about that together. I think that's what we need to make our, that's just my own view, that's what we need to make our college a better place for everybody and a better college. So uh, when we were talking about this at, the, uh, uh, at our meeting uh, for the Center of Ethics, and that's when, uh, why they had the great idea of, well, why don't we, why don't we sponsor this discussion? So thank you um, uh, to, uh, especially to Victoria and, and uh, Krista, who worked so hard for the, for the center. Um, uh, with that said, that, telling you that is the only agenda uh, that I have um, for the meeting. Uh, for the for, for our discussion, uh, you saw you saw the way that we uh, advertise this. Um, uh, we want to have a discussion aimed at exploring provocative questions raised by Haidt's ideas. Haidt's ideas. Sorry, I keep getting that wrong. Um, for example, are insensitive com comments microaggressions? Does speech have power to harm? Are there ideas that can't be raised in Luther classrooms? If you have other uh, uh, questions, uh, ideas, uh, reactions. Um, uh, beyond those, uh, uh, that, that, that'll, that'll be great. Um, my job will be to try to make sure that, we, that, that, that everybody gets a voice uh, and that we address at least these questions or whatever else you want to talk about. Uh, I, may, I may try to tweak the conversation to make sure that if there are people with, with different views about a particular issue, we want to make the space to make sure that all those views get on the table so that we can have a genuine discussion. Um, and, and, and with that said, uh, what are you thinking about? What do you want to say? Oh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, um, people who couldn't come requested that this be uh, recorded. recorded, thank you. And, uh, and also just to make sure that everybody can hear, we've got a couple of handheld microphones and uh, if you'd like to use one of those, we really, and the Zetas are helping us with those, maybe somebody will get one over kind of towards this side of the room. Um, and uh, so you can speak loudly, and uh, we think that the room system will hopefully pick you up, but if you want, we want to make sure everybody can be heard and heard uh, echoing down through the ages of others who may uh, listen in on this conversation. So use the mics if you need them, otherwise speak loudly. We want to make sure that people can be heard. Okay. Uh, yes. Oh. You can go ahead, Dan. All right, go. Um. Hi, okay, so um, I wasn't there for the Jonathan Haidt lecture, but like you said, I had a lot of people coming up to me and starting a conversation about it, and um, it was around the time that um, Halloween was coming up, and um, the person focused about the microaggressions thing, and um, it kind of led into a conversation about culture appropriation. So the person asked me, who wasn't a person of color, um, they said that they, um, wanted to have a, they had a costume idea in mind, and they didn't want to necessarily appropriate someone's culture, but they wanted to appreciate the culture and, you know, things of that nature. So they wanted to kind of, they, they were kind of wondering the fine line between culture appropriation and culture appreciation. And um, 
like how do they not offend, but how do they also express themselves and um, things that they love and things of that nature. So um, I, I, I honestly wasn't sure how to answer that. I just told them not to do it, to stay on the safe side. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I know it's a big issue and um, I was just wondering about that. Okay, thank you. Who has uh, thoughts, further thoughts on that? Winter, you want to say something about that? Or you I, I had a different one. Well, let's, all right, let's, uh, I want to, I mean, I want to make sure what are, what, are the, what are the ideas here? Cultural appropriation, offense, potential offense, right? That was the idea, potential offense. What, what, what was the connection to microaggressions? I mean, you, you mentioned those both in the same thing. What was the, what, what did you feel like was the connection there? Um, the person you mentioned Uh-huh. The person had gone to lecture, and I think they said something about um, um, Jonathan Haidt um, said that um, sometimes when you use microaggressions, it's not that you're trying to be offensive, but you're just trying to say something. Mm -hmm. And then that's when they were like, well, I'm not trying to be offensive with this costume, but um, they do, they've done a lot of research in the area. and. They love the culture and they like live in the area a couple of times for like semesters and stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, they were just trying to say, um, I don't want to offend, but I do want to like, I don't know, I guess they love this so much that they saw themselves in it, I guess. Okay. I'm not sure um, the person isn't here, but um, I guess that was it. So here's, a, so here's a person that's, that's taking sort of positive action, recognizing I might offend, and asking you for advice about, well, w should I do this, would this offend? And your advice was, don't play it, don't do it. Now, did, now okay, now did you say don't do it? You, you kind of sound like you said don't do it just for play it safe, yeah. you know? Or did you think, no, don't do it because it would be offensive whether you intend it or not? I'd say play it safe because okay. um, I didn't, okay. it didn't sound Okay, because one of the issues, and in fact, in fact, I think it was even one of the three main points, if I remember correctly, that uh, Professor Height raised, was this idea of, well, wait a minute, intentions, that intentions are complex, right? That intentions are a complex part of this thing, and w whether they matter, whether they don't matter, stuff like that. So here was a person plainly intending not to offend and trying to check it out ahead of time, and you're like, play it safe. So you think it might have been cool if they did it, but you're not... I don't think I would have had a problem with it. I okay. think that some other people would have okay. had a problem with it, yeah. but other people might have had a problem okay. with it. Well, y'all think that's a good idea? I don't like, you know, when in doubt, if somebody might get offended, just don't do it. Is that, is that, is that a good, is that? Is that I, think, I think I might be able to speak a little bit. Okay, go ahead. Um, so I, he brought up a slide that said that was the definition of a faux pas, and you related it with microaggressions. And um, I think that was, kind of a misunderstanding for me because I thought he was saying that microaggressions were an accident or a mistake that this person made. Mm -hmm. And I think he gave an example when someone asks, where are you from? And then you say, okay, I'm, I'm from Decor, Iowa. And then the follow-up question is, where are you really from? And yeah. so I think like going to the extent, asking that second question is a microaggression or it can be um, kind of deemed a microaggression asking, like it, saying that you don't really believe that they're actually from Decor, Iowa, for example. Okay. And so I think that him, in a sense, him using a, the term faux pas okay. in relation to the microaggressions um, was saying that these questions, these microaggressions are okay since they're only like accidents. And I didn't necessarily agree with that. Okay, thoughts on this? Good connection here. Yes. that his, uh, his point with bringing up faux pas wasn't that uh, all microaggressions are actually faux pas, but that some things that are often classified as microaggressions are actually accidental. They, are, they aren't intended, they aren't thought through far enough to actually be intentionally. Okay, okay. What, what, you, everybody else, what, what'd you hear? What, what, what did you think about this? This was a really central part of what I had to say. Uh, yeah, right, right down here, Gabe. 
Uh, I think that that is exactly what he was saying. Uh, but I think the problem is, even if it's an accident, something you should try to fix. If you accidentally bump into someone, it's not an intentional act of mm. violence, but it's still something you should, you know, try not to do again or something like that. So I think that's what people took issue with when he was saying that it's just a faux pas, it's just an accident. It doesn't change the fact that it might be offensive and hurt someone to hear. But is that violent? Is bumping into someone accidentally, I wouldn't call it violence, but I would still call it bad. I would still apologize if I bumped into someone. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I think for me, kind of the distinction that I was trying to hear, or like, I think what you guys are maybe, what I'm hearing you say, um, is that this is like a violent action. Um, and I think for me, I, I understand like, <coughs> A microaggression like this is maybe a violent action but I think he's trying to say and I think just around like like microaggression kind of assumes that the person performing the microaggression is an aggressive person and is like a maybe a bad person or like has something to say about their morality and I think he's saying people who perform these microaggressions are well-intentioned, they're good people, but they're performing violent acts. I, I don't know, like, like they're performing acts that are hurtful. Um, I don't know, that's what I, I just think there's a distinction between the act, action, and the actor. Okay, all right. Let, let me, who's ready? Let, let me ask a question for clarification here, okay? And this depends on my memory of the, of the lecture. You said, right, the faux, it's faux, his, he's like, it's faux pas, not microaggression, right? Is that, okay, is that the kind of the message you have here, okay? I didn't, I'm not sure that I remember him saying, and there's nothing wrong with faux pas. I thought he was like, no, they're bad. They're a dumbass thing to say, and you need to learn to do better. You need to learn to be more sensitive. You've made, you, you've, you've done something wrong, but I thought he was saying, but don't call it an aggression, okay? But maybe, but maybe I'm not right about that. Right? Is that, is that kind of? Yeah, I, I remember he was very careful to say that a faux pas is something terrible and embarrassing and okay. it, it's kind of hard for everyone involved. Okay. we want diverse institutions where different cultures and people of different backgrounds can interact with each other, faux pas and the, or the, people saying the wrong thing or being unintentionally unsensitive increases. So in order to sustain diverse institutions, we have to tolerate and forgive a certain amount of unintentional unsensitivity. That's what I got out of it. Okay, all right, all right. Could something be aggression that was unintended? Something could be an accident. I could bump into somebody, who was the example here. I could bump into someone and it wasn't intentional, and maybe I could even hurt them, but it's not an aggressive thing. But could, but could these things be aggressions? Because this is what, again, I'm just going on sort of what you're saying here about his point. Could it still be an aggression if it's unintentional? That seemed to be one of the sorry philosophical points that was hiding under, under, this, under this. What do you think? Was that one of the issues on the table that, that was there? Uh, yeah, who's back to winter if no one else? I'm going to get as many voices in here as possible. I'll try to keep mine out of it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think it's up to kind of the recipient of the question based on if the question is aggressive or not. So if someone could s perform a microaggression, it's kind of up to the person who is being asked whether or not it's aggressive, maybe, depending on when. If the person asking the question is meaning it as unaggressive, if that kind of makes sense. 
And I think like there also comes to a point where the letting these microaggressions slip by or like letting them go by, like what, what's the extent to where it's just happening all the time and then people are getting offended, but it doesn't matter because they're a faux pas or it's just a mistake. So I think addressing these microaggressions rather than labeling them as faux pas could be a solution. Okay, a couple of different ideas in there. Somebody want to respond? Okay. And really, we, okay. I'll take the opposite point and I'll, uh, I'll posit that it's not actually up to the person who is receiving the comment, but it's up to the actual intentions. So I'm going to say that aggression is about intention Okay. And something cannot be aggressive unless it was a, a intended that way. Okay, okay, all right. All right. All, right. That's a, all right, that's a clear point. What do you think about that? It's a really important idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh yes, please, right there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I guess I would argue the opposite. And I guess I'm not sure if I'm clear exactly on what Winter was saying. But I think I would take the point that it, intention is definitely important. But I don't, like you can't control anybody but yourself. You can't control all the situations around you. And you can have the, the, the nicest intention and still someone else who is out of your control can read that, can take that a different way. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But a lot of these things happen outside of a one-on-one -on -one situation. It's something you see, it's something you hear, it's something you see from someone else. And then there's even more uncontrolled circumstances so regardless if you had a good intention, you can still, or, or even if it wasn't a good intention at all, if it was just not a purposefully aggressive intention, like you can't control someone else reading it that way and like thinking about the context of where that person is coming from. Like you even think about, okay, I don't hold the door open for someone and they get really mad about it. Well, maybe they've been having like the worst day of their life. Okay. And you know, so you, know, you don't know the context of that person. Right. And so I, I think that you can't, it's not fair to tell them this isn't aggression, like you're not reading that correctly. And they might not be reading it correctly according to what you tried to intend to do, but it can still come off as aggression to the other person. Okay, all right, all right, thank you. Down in front, please. Yeah, <clears throat> I kind of think that uh, hype places too much emphasis on the, the aggression okay. part, because the actual definition is just like, something that's derogatory okay. or, or negative. And I think that is more undisputed than whether or not it's aggressive or violent. Okay, so look, can, I, can I push on that a little bit? So, that, so, so the badness of it, as you say, der derogatory, I'm sorry, what, what was the other? Derogatory or negative. Yeah, okay, so, so, so the can it be derogatory or negative independent of intention? This seems to be one of the sort of central issues here, is the role of intention. So, so can, can I do something, for example, that turns out to have, a, it, it's derogatory, right? It puts someone down, or uh, it's negative in a way, even though I have no intention of doing that. I'm just being, I'm just asking, I'm trying to ask a friendly question, Try, yeah. right? Okay, okay, so, so, so we want to focus then, so you're suggesting, well, we need to focus on the effect, yeah. the negative effect, and you're saying it's independent of people's intention, or it can be. Yeah. Okay, what do you, what do you think about that? Uh, okay, yeah. anybody, anybody, any new person, I'm gonna call on any new person before we, we cycle back around. Bob, go ahead, there, please, thank you. Um, last, I think it was March, um, somebody carved a, a swastika and the letters KKK in the snow on the football field here at Luther. And um, I remember at the time when I heard about this, I thought, well, you know, I didn't like that, that that happened, but I, I sort of passed it off as, well, just somebody doing something stupid. But I had a colleague who was Jewish, and she was shaken to the core by this action in a way that it, at first I did not understand. And I'm not sure that I fully understood it until a few weeks ago when somebody went into the synagogue in Pittsburgh and killed 11 um, Jewish people in that synagogue. And I think that we have to, uh, when we talk about microaggressions, that those of us like myself who are part of the dominant culture are really not in a good position 
to determine how somebody um, who is a recipient of a microaggression is feeling and, and responding to that. And I think Jonathan Haidt underplayed the role of systemic racism and anti-Semitism in this country um, because you know, people who are the recipients of, of a microaggression um, are people who are living in a state of vulnerability. There really are people in America who want to kill Jews, who want to kill African Americans, who want to kill Latinos. That, I mean, that really happens. And so when, when a microaggression occurs, the person doing it may have good intentions. They may not be a bad person or wanting to harm the person. But, there is, but, but that microaggression, it seems to me, just reinforces for that person their state of vulnerability. And that's something that those of us who are part of the dominant culture do not have to live with and experience. And so I don't think that we're really in a good position to judge the, the responses of people of color to microaggressions. We need to listen to what they tell us about what they're experiencing when those things happen. Uh, and I, I really think that Jonathan Haidt underplayed the role of, system, really ignored the role of systemic racism um, in, his, in his analysis. Thank you, what do you think? Yes. Um, so um, I wasn't here for Professor Haidt's um, lecture, but um, the way I understand it is, I think it's a uh, effect has a lot to do with um, uh, um, the microaggression. Um, so intention doesn't really matter too much. Um, well, it can count for something if the effect is very little. For example, a case of mistaken identity. Someone um, getting my brother and I confused. They call us by the wrong name. We can brush that off. Um, but when the stakes are much greater, for example, um, and we're talking about uh, life or death um, situations, or uh, situ uh, uh, situations that may, you know, change someone's life, you know, forever, um, uh, a jury judging a black person, um, uh, you know, for example, in the um, in the, in the cases uh, where policemen have been brought against a jury and the jury has um, voted in favor of the policemen even though evidence suggests that they did uh, use aggress you know, um, too much force in, in arresting a black person, the black person died. Situations like that, and you know, the jury is mostly white and that kind of thing. So I think once the stakes go higher, you have to listen to the person who has been affected more because it matters more to them than it does to the person who committed the act. And you know, um, just because you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to, you, know, you can say you're sorry at the end of it, but if you're doing something that drastically changes someone's life, okay. I feel like the, you know, the, you, you, the, you know, you, people have to look at you a bit more as opposed to the victim. Okay, all right. Can, can I ask a follow-up question there? I really appreciate that. So, so I, I, I see you, you were still responding sort of in the, at the personal level, right? That's to say, okay, we need to listen to the person who's the recipient of this possible microaggression, right? Um, but one of the considerations that's on the table are these systemic issues, right? That, 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 I, that, that the fact of the matter is the police have a different attitude in our town towards me than towards you. Right? And I didn't, do, I didn't make that, you didn't make that, but that's the case because there's these systemic attitudes. I think Bob was maybe kind of pushing on that a little bit. So, so, so you're more likely to recognize that, that attitude than me. And I'm like, right? Because it doesn't, they don't do it to me. They have their own reasons for doing it to me. So. <laughs> So, but, but is it, it, it's not because it's you, it's because, we, because of recognizing, I'm asking, is it a personal thing, is it an individual thing, or, is it be, or does it have to do with this system? Because you were referring to that system, right? There are structures and attitudes in place that affect juries, that affect, that affect the way police officers act, and so on. So 
so what do you think about that? What do you think about the sort of the structural or social thing versus the individual? Because as an individual, you can say, oh, no, don't bother me. That's OK. But maybe it should bother you. You see what I'm asking here? Yes. Um, I think it's, um, well, OK, again, I think I have to bring up the fact that I I am not American, and I'm still kind of struggling to like um, get a grips with just how fractured, um, you know, the, you know, the country is in a social sense. Um, but to think structurally, like, you know, whenever I think about uh, the structure of America, it it almost seems like, uh, you know, like things are so fractured that you know why even begin to to tackle them you know and it 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 just in my mind it seems it would take such a drastic shift okay. to get things moving i mean I, I guess uh if you look at history you can say okay there's been a massive shift of course but uh i don't know just uh for example looking at um you know the way police be the way the police treat my minorities the way um, uh, um, candidates who are running for election speak about minorities, uh, the way um, certain institutions, colleges, what they teach and what they promote. Uh, and you know, these are very public things and just seeing kind of all that play out. It seems that the, I don't know, you almost can't. I I cannot. I cannot trust the system to. Um, I I cannot trust the system to change if I put in the effort and the time, and I feel you can. The best you can do is start at the individual and then work your way out. So yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Let me let me let me ask this question then, because since you brought up about well, what how, how can we change this, right? Is this even changeable? Who can change it? I'm thinking back. I think I think it was Griffin's comment, but I'm not sure. About well, how are we supposed to tell me if I'm wrong, or I'll, or I'll just put words in your mouth or distort your words? But but uh, um, you were saying like, well, how can we begin to have a community where we can talk to each other about this stuff? Unless we sort of relax a little bit about and saying, well, let's not, you know, let people's good, let, let's, let's give more weight to people's good intentions or something like that. Is that right? Yeah, that's how I interpreted Height's point. Okay. And I think that that's okay. a certain point, obviously, okay. becomes non right. and the stakes are, are too Okay, high, all right. It really is aggression. Right. Okay, all right, so that's what, and that's, so you see, y'all see what I'm looking to do here? I'm just looking to try to say, well, okay, how do we take that and respond to this concern about making a place, a community, maybe it's a small start, but making a community where people are free to talk to each other. Nancy, what do you think about that? Actually, I, have to, um, I want to respond to something a little bit earlier. Good, okay. Then I'll answer your question if you like. Okay. But, um, I'm still putting together um, the last, some of the last comments that we had, and going back to the, if you bump into someone, is, you know, is that it, uh, with the intent? Because I think part of it has to do with the shared understanding, and I think that the bumping into someone example works on some level and works and doesn't work on another. On some level, if I bump into someone, I will apologize if it's you know inadvertent because I recognize that bumping into someone is could be potentially harmful. But I think that the issue that comes up with microaggressions and what Bob is talking about with where he was seeing the swastika and the KKK as perhaps <laughs> akin to maybe bumping into someone is not necessarily recognizing that the bump could be aggressive or violent. And so unless there's a shared understanding of the action or the words as being potentially harmful, I think that's where a lot of the, the lack of communication comes from. Because there needs to be a share, shared understanding as to what constitutes, constitutes an aggressive okay. act. And without that shared understanding, then you can have people saying, well, I didn't mean it. Therefore, it can't have been aggressive. Yes. Okay. Because there's that, li there's the, I didn't bump into you and say, sorry, because I didn't even recognize that I bumped into you. Okay. What do you think? Or is this the place, oh, Steve, okay. Because I was going to say, is this the place where I ask, <laughs> does speech have the power to harm? <laughs> 
but maybe not yet. Maybe we're not ready to get there yet. Steve, I'm Steve. Passing the mic if that's the case. All right, go, go, go ahead, um, go ahead. So I don't, I don't know, if I'm trying to make sense of this too, and I don't know exactly what I think, but it seems like we're, we're struggling with this dichotomy between I knew this was aggressive or I didn't know, and maybe there's a third choice that I didn't know, but I should have known. Okay. And, and trying to figure out what we should know, I think is really, really challenging. It's, as something becomes more systemic, it seems like your responsibility to know grows. As the magnitude of the harm gets bigger, your responsibility to know seems to grow. But I, I think it's really hard to know what should I have known and, and is what I said, you know, hurting somebody. The, the, the fifth time Professor Gates Madsen crashes into me and says, oh, sorry. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> well, and then maybe what we need to do is, instead of just saying, oh, it, she didn't know any better, it's a faux pas, is to do like you do with little kids, is to stop and say, hey, this is not what you should do. You might not have known that. Your intention may have been harmless, mm -hmm. but it did cause hurt mm -hmm. and to, I guess I've been struggling with the, okay, so what do we do now kind of thing. Um, I'm not a philosopher. So <laughs> it's the, all right, I agree there's a problem, but then how do we stop and teach in, in a, a thoughtful way, not just in a I'm hurt way, okay. um, but also realizing that that puts, unfortunately, a big burden on those who are affected by this on a daily basis. Okay. All right. Couple down here. Let's uh, here we go. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, I think that um, we not really intentionally. I think we've not intentionally ignored this topic, but I think that um, the idea of what do we do now? Okay, can I can I interrupt right there? Yeah. When you say we, you tell about. Sorry, um, the general discussion. So okay, um, our, our general discussion, our discussion here tonight. right now. Okay, all right, thank you. So um, when we're looking at kind of what do we do now to grapple with this, okay. um, and by we I mean like how how do people that unintentionally um, harm someone else, how do those people grapple with okay. um, that kind of after the fact? Um, I think that we as a group here um, need to also look at the potential for education there. Okay. Um, it's hard to thrive in an area where we're not okay with being vulnerable to diversity and vulnerable to making mistakes. And um, But I think that we can't stop there and instead it's important to educate on why a mistake is a mistake okay. and give that space people to be able to be vulnerable and um, also follow up with the education that is necessary to kind of correct microaggressions and um, faux pas. Okay, can I, can I, can I, put, thank you, but can I just push a little more and look, to, um, when you talk about the vulnerability, okay, so, so, uh, so I, so I do something stupid that I should have known better, right, I should have known would be hurtful to you. But I didn't, and I do, okay? So, and now, like, you're gonna, so where's the vulner, so I wanna try to try to identify the, the vulnerability, identify the thing that we wanna get at. You wanna make it, you wanna make a way that makes it easier or better or somehow or another for you to be able to tell that to me, or do I need to be, have my head in a space where I can, where I can hear that from you, when you say that, I'm like, oh, okay, right, instead of getting, you know, having some other negative reaction, or do we need some outside something 
that, that tells that, that, that will help me, right, not do that again because I should have known. Do you see what I'm asking there? Can you be more specific? Maybe you can't, which is fine. I'm just. Oh, yeah, I sort of maybe can. I don't know fully, but um, I think the give and take of vulnerability, so the ability to recognize that someone may have made a mistake, but also the ability to recognize that a mistake is only a mistake, okay. you know, when it's done once or twice. Okay. And okay. Um, the ability to open that space for the person that maybe made that mistake um, to say, oh, I didn't know, and please teach me okay. why I was, you know, in the wrong here. Okay. Um, as well as the ability for someone to feel comfortable to say, hey, that really, that hurt me. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for, very much. Yeah. So uh, going back to um, her point with, like, needing to um, educate people that uh, microaggressions can be harmful, I very much agree with, that because they can be harmful uh, regardless of intention. But uh, I think it's different. We have to also, and I think this was Jonathan Haidt's point, um, was that if we, uh, we need to not call these microaggressions because most of the time people aren't being aggressive when they're just asking where you're from or something. Right. Um, and so if we, uh, like, I don't know, trying to say this, like, if we call them faux pas, then it, which is because they're just mistakes, then the people who are, uh, have the micro, who are the recipients of the microaggressions, um, are less likely to view that person as a bad person, and yeah. can then you can then work to um, correct the to, and educate them to say that it's more of a an error, and yeah. you know yeah. what I'm trying to say. Sure. Okay, can yeah. I can I? Hey, this, this is really interesting. I like this, Let, but I want to I want to ask you something about something that I, I'm sorry I don't even remember who said. Okay, so 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 we're gonna keep using the bump into me thing, okay? And you say, well, okay, if you, if you, so if the person gets bumped into. I'm not gonna see you as a bad person. I'm just gonna like, hey, you know, he bumped into me. Oh, sorry, da da da. Okay, but this is the tenth time, okay? Right? Someone points out this is the tenth time I've been bumped into, and other people aren't getting bumped into as much as I'm getting bumped into, okay? Right? Only you didn't do it all ten times, right? It was nine other people, right? So you see what I mean? So I, I'm, I'm seeing a, a complexity here that we haven't totally got at, right? That, that, okay, if it happens over and over again, then there's a bigger problem. But if this was the first time you did it or I did it to you, then in some way I'm part of the problem, but I'm not the, all by myself to beg. How are, we supposed to, how are we supposed to negotiate that? How are we supposed to think through that? You see what I'm asking? You got any thoughts yeah. about that or anybody have any thoughts about that? I, was that your idea that came up first? Yes. Can we let him go back? Do you mind? So I think one of the things that when, when somebody bumps into you for that like um, umpteenth time, you have to kind of acknowledge that it's not, because he talked a little bit about call-out culture and that people are reflexive to call-out culture with the fact that, well, I'm not a bad person, so therefore your logic must be wrong. But it's kind of like not calling them out as a bad person, okay. but calling them out as a symptom of a bad culture or of a bad yeah. society okay. or a bad aspect of that okay. society. Mm -hmm. So we need to acknowledge that we're not that you're not a bad person for running into somebody, and if you call out somebody, you need to acknowledge that you shouldn't call them out specifically, but that action and talking about it as a part of the larger culture. Okay. Do you Oh, it, right, right behind you. Can you pass back? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I was just going to go back to this idea um, of the education. Um, I think, Piper, you talk about a lot, like how you educate someone from even before they are able to go to that microaggression, which I think it should be called a microaggression despite the intentions because, I mean, it is what it is despite, you know, your intention, you know. Um, so, but I think that you kind of talked about how after someone bumps into you, then you say, hey, you shouldn't bump into me. Or the professor talked about how when a child does something wrong, you should correct that child immediately. But like you kept saying when you are bumped into so many times, and it's like you have to educate everyone okay. that you've been educating all day. Okay. And then it 
kind of takes a toll on you as a person and it kind of, I don't know, turns your role into an educator, which some people don't want that. They don't want to have to be that person in um, someone's lives. Like it shouldn't be that person's fault that you don't know um, these things. So then it turns into how do you educate people who are, who might not know any better or, you know, cause when I came to Luther, I came from Chicago, which is very di diverse. Mm -hmm. And I came here and some people had never seen black people or some people had never, mm -hmm. you know, experienced anything else besides what they see on television. So a lot of them didn't know when I understood that, but mm -hmm. I didn't want to have to explain to them or, mm -hmm you know, things like that. So how do you, you know, educate people without without the person that you bumped into having to be the educator? Okay. Thank you. Great. So I, I, so is somebody else supposed to go? No, 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 you're right, you're up, go ahead. Yeah, the sorry, sorry, I'm just lining up, I'm just lining up new people, okay, right? No, you're on, thank you. So I, I really do appreciate what uh, she said just now because Taking the, I think the good thing about microaggressions or the concept of microaggressions is that it takes the responsibility of the person who is, not the victim, of the person who is on the receiving on end of the microaggression of being the educator to the person who is okay. actually doing okay. the microaggression. It is, the concept of microaggression makes people more edgy to the sense that maybe I need to be a little bit more educated before I go and start talking to people about that. And I think what Hyde did, and I talked about this in class too, is he, he had this picture where you had a really safe playground, and then you, uh, he also had another picture where there were 50 foot drops, uh, that's what you said, Professor Christman. And what, what Hyde did was he, he set up a line, or he, he set up where the playground should be from his perspective, okay. as, as a white, uh, white man. And, and I don't think, I don't think we, everybody should be following his perspective. I think, I think there's a little bit more room to wiggle. And I, he talked about what, what the role of, a, uh, of an institution, of a, like a college or university should be. Mm -hmm. um, and he said it should be to question, challenge people. And I also think a role of a university or a college is to set new norms that the society will follow tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We're gonna go out of college and we're gonna be in different places leading the world. And if we are setting new norms, which are gonna be in theory, lead, lead to a better world. And I, I don't have a problem with that. I, th I think it's a good thing. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Um, one thing I really struggle with with this conversation is I feel like we're not getting all the information here. And I really understand the victim's perspective, and I really respect the fact that we are addressing these issues but the part of me that wants more information is questioning if we're not looking at the people committing these actions more. And I keep thinking that everybody comes from a different background and the people who are committing these quote unquote micro, microaggressions may not have the privilege of being exposed to diverse mindsets and having the privilege of building that empathy over their lives. So I guess a part of me is wondering if we should try and understand that they're coming from a place of ignorance too, and that they have things that I, they aren't afforded to some degree as well. Okay, all right, so but have, we've seen a couple of things that seem to me, if I can just sort of sum up a little bit at this point, we've seen a couple of things that seem to touch on that, right? That raises the question of education, right? You're talking about ignorance. Mm -hmm. So maybe we, we've talked about, well, let's not be, maybe some have said, some have said, let's not be too quick to say you're the bad guy, right? Because like, maybe you're ignorant, okay? I'm ignorant. But then ignorance caused, it's still a problem, right? So ignorance then caused for fixing it, right? For learning something. I mean, it's college after all, okay? But then who's responsible? Then, but that, then we were just on the little trail of the conversation a second ago about, well, wait a minute. Should it, should it be... Should it be the responsibility of the people who have to hear this ignorance stuff over and over to begin with to, in addition, be the ones with the primary responsibility to, edu to, to end the ignorance? Or is there another way? Okay. So that's one of, the, one of the sort of issues and sets of questions that I'm hearing here. Does that, does that make sense to you? So, so what should we do? And one of, the, one of the things I was eager to come into this for, and I'm not going to turn it into a discussion for this, but I'm eager to know, look, I'm a professor here. Right? So in a lot of what goes on in classroom, what goes on in my classrooms, 
I have something to do with. Okay? I'm not in total control of it, but I'm a lot of it. Just like right now, right? Okay. Am I, how am I doing, right? I'm, right? I've got a little bit of control here. I'm calling on people and I'm shaping stuff. Am I, am I doing okay, right? How could I do it better, right? As a professor, as a white guy in Decora, on and on down the line, right? So that's a question that I come into this with. Um, um, they're not look, you know, send me an email or something like that. Send me an anonymous, <laughs> send me an anonymous email. I'd be, be very ha happy to have it. But this question, I think, I just want to emphasize it. The question of, okay, if it's a matter of ignorance, and maybe it's ignorance that we should know better, right? I'll bring back, you know, Steve's point. But we don't, or I don't. I probably did it since we came in the room here, because I'm talking so much, right? I can't talk 10 minutes without doing it, I'm sure, right? And so, yeah, we have to try to figure out who am I in this situation, and what do I need to know? Good point. Yeah, uh, yes. Thank you. Of, of being in a position of ignorance. Okay. Uh, if we're going to help people who are in that position, mm -hmm. um, we can't stigmatize them. Mm -hmm. If we use labels like microaggression to describe what people are unintentionally doing because they're in a position of ignorance, okay. it's going to make them feel like they are being victimized instead of the position that the person who's receiving the quote unquote microaggression would be in, which is they think that they're being victimized. So now we have someone who feels like they're being victimized by microaggression and people who feel like they're being victimized because they're being told that they're a bad person or committing bad acts okay. where they think that they, they don't understand the situation because they just don't know any better. Okay, all right, who's gonna help us out there? All right, all right, right, right. Gabe's been waiting for a while, and then right here, we got. Can we get another mic down here? We got both mics on the same side of the room. Okay. Okay. All right, Gabriel, go ahead. Well, I've got two two things I want to say. First of all, if someone says to you that thing that you just said to me was a microaggression, and uh, I didn't like it, I would like if in, in if in the future you didn't say things like that, and your response is. Well, actually, it wasn't a microaggression; it was a faux pas. You're, you're, maybe, maybe it shouldn't be called a microaggression. But the point is, you can't just dodge the question. You, you need to be. But what I'm saying is, Jonathan Haidt is dodging the question, and he's dodging; he's avoiding the issue. He's turning the, the discussion from something about uh, social justice into semantics. And that's a problem, I think. Um, I think being told that you're doing a microaggression when you think you're actually doing a faux pas is not on the same level as uh, experiencing a, a racist or homophobic or transphobic microaggression. Okay, let, we one here, two in the back. Thank you, Gabriel. That's Please. actually kind of what I was going to say is that what is this double standard that height is? What is what is this double standard that height is is advocating? Or I, I don't know, but like because <clears throat> you're saying people shouldn't have to feel stigmatized for. Being called a microaggressor, but uh, I lost my train of thought. Okay. <laughs> I think I know where you're going with that. Um, um, uh, you're saying that uh, saying, okay, well, I shouldn't feel like I'm a microaggressor uh, because because I'm doing these things that are intentional. Uh, well, what, what about the person who's receiving these? They feel like Standard is that by trying to have compassion 
Maybe. <laughs> you know what? I'm cheap. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, in the back. Thank you. Hey. Um, so I'm doing a research paper on this. I'm in high school, and I've been sort of wrestling with this issue of it's like, you know, what is sort of who's really like should be criticized here of the person claiming to be microaggressed or the person that is micro or doing the microaggression. Um, and I think from what I can tell so far, I, I agree with someone who said, I don't, I don't know if there's enough information always. There's a rule at the high school that if a parent feels that the coach is, or a coach or a teacher or something has done something that is absolutely awful and they, they want to take it up with um, the administration, that they have to wait 24 hours before they can talk to somebody okay. who's of authority about it. Um, I think that that's probably the best way to handle a lot of these situations because it's very easy to get very worked up very fast over this sort of issue. Okay. Um, I think that, like, I agree with some of what Jonathan Haidt is saying, or whatever his name is, and I think that Again. we should, um, I think we should settle down and practice like charity of they, they probably didn't mean it and just bear that in mind all the time um, like when we're going about doing something try to be the best person like Nelson Mandela it's like one of my favorite things about him is that he there were a group of of the indigenous Africans or whatever that wanted to have like complete power they didn't want to have both whites and blacks in power in South Africa, and he he did not agree with them at all. He wanted to have, he didn't want to, you know, swing it back in the in the other direction because then they would be just as bad as the people that had oppressed them yeah. for so long. Yeah. So I, I just think that that and just sort of bearing in mind Nelson Mandela's sort of principles of love conquers hate, not hate, and trying to be as patient as possible with somebody who doesn't understand something or doesn't understand what they're doing wrong or or be you know as patient as you can with somebody who claims that you're doing something wrong and to never assume that you're right and they're wrong okay thank you i think i may come back to your your principle of charity there in a second we have another person here in the back and then right down here okay yeah, please go ahead so i think we're kind of ignoring the victim of the microaggression here okay and I think that the victims, my statement's kind of short. I think that the victim's feelings are more important okay. than the feelings of the person okay. or persons who have asked them where they're from, from 10 times in a week, okay. right? The person who's being asked that question 10 times in a week, their feelings are more important because they are the victim of stigma, like stigmatization. Okay. And that's, I think that's more, a little bit more, maybe we could, should consider them first. Okay. And that's all, so. All right, thank you. Danny, thank you. Thanks. I'll, I'll say this. I think words do matter. I think labels matter. Um, I think what we need is more conversation, not less. Okay. And when we use words like microaggression, aggression, racism, racist, okay. I mean, to call somebody a racist in this society is one of the worst things one can be called. It's like calling somebody a Holocaust denier. It's like calling somebody a child molester, a, a scam artist that would steal from widows and orphans. I mean, this is to call someone a racist, to use that kind of language. I mean, for me to speak up in a meeting like this is, I, I look at this conversation or conversations like this, I'm a white guy, middle-aged white guy, able-bodied. I mean, what are, the, what are the risks to me they are great. If I say the wrong word, the wrong thing, express the wrong idea, or if I'm misunderstood, I might be hauled into a dean's office tomorrow morning. I mean, the risks are very great. And the, what are the possible benefits? Well, there might be some. But I look at this, and I do this risk-benefit analysis, and I just kind of clam up, usually. When conversations like this begin, I just don't say anything. And that's how I feel right now. I mean, it's it's a risky thing for me to step into this conversation because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I I'm, might say the wrong thing, might use the wrong adjective, okay. might, might be misunderstood. 
So I think if the goal, the goal to me is healing. What we need is healing and reconciliation. A lot of what I heard Height say that night had sounded to me like words of reconciliation and words of healing. To, to get us there, I think we need, to, we need more conversation, not less, and I think we need to make a place where people feel safe to speak. People of goodwill have, have the courage to speak up and know that if I say the wrong, if I use the wrong adjective, I'm not gonna be hauled into a dean's office tomorrow morning. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I've been thinking about all of this stuff. Um, and so I think I 100% agree, like dialogue, conversation is what's going to kind of like make a difference and like kind of end this ignorance or like to make sure there's less microaggression, faux pas in the future. Okay. Um, and I think kind of like the little debate that's happened in here is between like, if we label it a microaggression that can put a person who commits the act of microaggression on the defensive and can cut off dialogue and kind of end dialogue, and then that person will remain in their ignorance um, potentially and, and continue to, to commit microaggressions. Um, so we, Jonathan Haidt put, put forward faux pas as, as a word to replace that. And I think his intention is, is reconciliation, is to, is to have people be more open in, in this conversation to end ignorance. Um, but what we've been talking about here tonight is how faux pas doesn't recognize the um, pain that can be inflicted on another person and, and the effect that um, a microaggression can have. Okay. And so there's like a, a disconnect between like faux pas doesn't do enough to acknowledge the negative effects of the, of the action, of okay. the words, but microaggression um, doesn't do enough to acknowledge the intention of the person speaking. And so that cuts off dialogue so they do more microaggression. So I've been trying to think, like in this time here, I, I didn't come in, but like what kind of word can we use to replace them? Like what's it, and like right now I'm, I'm kind of at a place where like, how, how does accidental aggression sound? Because it, it I don't know. I, that's what I, I don't think it was the micro part that was the issue. <laughs> yeah. I think it might have been the other side. No, very, very, very well said. What we're, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the clock here, and I want to remind us that we, we are going to stop at eight o'clock because that's what we promised to do, right? So we got 30 more minutes, and we can go in whatever direction y'all want to go. But we got other questions we can do. We can keep going on this way. But I, I do want to stop at this moment and talk about what I'm seeing here as these issues being raised about the nature of our community. How do we create a space that acknowledges the pain that some in our community experience for whatever reasons, the, the actual pain, to acknowledge the systemic or structural situations that give different ones of us different experiences so that we're not all as aware of what's happening there. And yet, that also acknowledges we have to figure out how to, how to teach each other, right? How to, how to, how to, how to, well, I, you said it better than I could do, right? I just, I just want to sort of stop and emphasize that, right? That we're, that we're looking at something here I, I will say one thing. I was talking with a colleague about this this morning who I respect a great deal, a fa another person on the faculty, tremendous uh, person who couldn't be here. And, uh, and this colleague was saying, look, I think the thing is the, the microaggression word that, that uh, um, what's his name, Height, stepped on a mine there because, that, because we get focused on that when the real issue are the kinds of issues that have been brought up all along. But wait a minute, there's real pain here. There's, there's real structural inequality here. Not all of us have the same experience. There's, but there's also, uh, 
a real sense in our community that, well, wait a minute, I, we, that when faced with, with trying to recognize that, I shut down because, be, because I don't, right, it's not safe for me to be for, for a different kind of a reason in that conversation, right? Is that something we care about, all of those things? And is that something that we can figure out what to do about? And that was, the, the, if I can speak for the Center for Ethics, that was one of the hope of this conversation, right, is to really get that on the table. So, so with that said, let's go back to talking about, uh, uh, you know, this uh, you know, sort of end point there with a reminder. We've got 30 more minutes. If there's some other kind of a question that you want to make sure to get on the table, let's get it on the table. Or if you want to keep uh, uh, pressing into this, let's do. I see a new voice right here. I'd like to get the microphone. Oh, one new voice here, and then the microphone to him, okay? Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. Don, you go. I'm curious to know uh, what people heard in the lecture about that would be the connection between uh, aggression, whether it's microaggression or accidental aggression or intentional or faux pas, and the, the question of or the issue of um, the emotional resilience or the lack of emotional resilience that seem to be the problem, whether it's the presenting problem that goes back to the, the structural issues, I don't know. But I'd be curious to hear what, if any, uh, connections uh, people heard or, or what they think about that idea of emotional resilience. Okay. That's the strong, I'm just trying to remember his first point. Well, makes you weak, makes you stronger, don't kill you. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. What, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker was his, his sort of flip side thing, right? That's the resilience part you're talking about? Okay, good, thank you. Anybody want to say, uh, Jamie, do you want to say something about that real quick? Yeah. Okay, all right, can we just, uh, I'll just interrupt the queue here. I don't need a mic, but. Yeah, no, um, no, yeah, you do. We, we want to reserve <laughs> this. My thought on the emotional, okay, this thing's loud. My thought on emotional resilience. Um, along with a lot of things in his lecture, I think he used it as a broad term to refer to a lot of people's responses, which when there is a wide array of things he was probably referring to. I agree that we could use the term emotional resilience to talk about some of the other things we've been talking about, like being more empathetic and being more vulnerable and not using emotional logic, taking the 24 hours to feel what you're feeling and then work towards having a conversation mm -hmm. about it. I don't think I agree with him in pinpointing that people just need to toughen up a bit. I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, I do agree that emotional logic is not the best way to go about making a point or making an argument. And I think that leads into our larger discussion about using somebody's individual experience to as a like sound like a starting point to talk about larger systemic structural issues but how we go about doing that is what gets difficult so how do i tell somebody or how does one person say okay i'm feeling this right now and this is an educational point for you because i'm feeling this way but we're going to use it to talk about systematic racism in this country that both of us are playing into it right now because i'm a victim of it and because you're perpetuating it however you want to do that. Now I'm just kind of rambling. Um, yeah, lost it. No, you had it. Good, good. Okay. Thank you. So my comment might be a little bit idealistic, but um, I took linguistics last year, and we talked about um, how people with different dialects have a shared burden of communication and understanding. Um, and I know this is really hard to achieve, but one of the things when you come to college is it's a new start. and the university can come up with some ground rules. Um, for instance, my high school district talked about taking risks, um, both teachers and students in academic endeavors, um, but also just having that desire to learn and have free speech, um, establishing that common ground. And I, my question is kind of who is responsible for that? Because I think there's a large movement on this campus from the ground up of students and faculty um, with this desire. Um, but I think usually the administration is responsible for that. But also, um, administrations often have trouble like showing their emotions. Like I went to the Her Herbert Hoover um, Presidential Library recently, and 
Herbert Hoover was a president who was, he was a Quaker in background and he had a hard time showing his emotions. And so people thought he was heartless and terrible president and for other reasons. But um, <laughs> um, so I, my, my question is who is really responsible for the emotional resilience? Is the administration allowed to show their emotion too? Um, yeah. Thank you, okay. A lot there. Who is responsible? I love, could, could you give us again that phrase, the phrase of linguistic, the, was it a mutual burden, a reciprocal shared burden? burden? The shared burden of communication. Well, who's responsible for, for creating the framework to nurture that? That's the question you have on the table. Yes? Okay, good. I just want to make, that's a, it's a, it's a great question. Thank you. Yes, right here in the middle. Did you get a mic yet? Yeah. Yes? I, <laughs> yeah, okay. I had kind of a different that, that's that's so okay, I right? I want to I want to get as many ideas on the table as we can, just to have them out there. Okay, well, this is kind of uh, going back a question, and uh, I think that Height's lecture wasn't so much about microaggressions, but he brings up microaggressions as a symptom of a broad campus climate in which people in universities all across the country, and to some extent this one, are afraid of saying anything. Okay. So his lecture really focuses on the kind of essential goals of institutions. A hospital that doesn't heal is a bad hospital. And, a, okay. so, and what is the essential goal of a college he says, Luke's at Veritas, so it's light and truth, it's okay. education. Okay. So he, his accusation against the American university system is pretty extreme, okay. but when he asked if anyone in the audience had ever felt in a class that if they had a different viewpoint, they better just shut up, uh, a lot of people raised their hands. And I think that's really concerning. I think that it's something that we should talk about, that campuses are overwhelmingly liberal, and there aren't a lot of viewpoints in diversity. And that creates a climate where people are afraid to say the wrong thing. OK, all right. Yes. Yeah, so um, relating to that, <clears throat> uh, from the lecture, I probably have a very different reaction to a lot of students who probably belong to the minority group as well. Um, I kind of really liked a lot of points that he was saying because I was looking at it from a perspective of making uh, kind of making peace and, and bringing the community together. Yeah. And as an international student here, I feel like, um, pushing the idea of microaggression, which is a real thing, but pushing it too hard will only separate people even more and just shut people ad, up, like you said. Um, and I will speak for myself that I'd rather somebody come and ask me about things that they didn't know about me and my identity rather than not asking at all and just like ignore me. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's one of the reasons why there's separate groups on campus. Um, so. Although not ignoring the microaggression, I think that we, we definitely need a more conversation and, and, and a safer space for everybody to feel comfortable asking questions, and especially at a university and college environment where people are here to learn. And yeah. if we're not uh, allowing them to learn about the differences, then that's kind of a big missing point. And I'm trying to imagine this um, in a different setting as well that's not in the US. I feel like wherever are you going, if if you're not the minority, uh, if you're not the majority um, group, if you don't belong to the majority, you you it's sad to know, but you you will get um, offended a lot because of a lot of things because people are not going to know about you um, around the world if you're walking around and they don't know about your countries and it's a sad fact, but it just happens and I know it's ha it, it's. It, um, it sucks to suck it up, but pushing it away is only gonna make us more divided. That's, I think, my point here, yeah. Okay, thank you. I see two, two here, one in the front, one in the back. Let me, let me ask this question. 
what we're, what's been raised here is the question of whether the goal of a college or university, this free exchange of ideas or whatever is necessary for us to seek light and truth, is that in tension with our respecting everybody and making sure people don't, intentionally or not, unintentionally or not, as we were talking about for uh, much of the first part of the discussion, that, that people are hurt by the way in which we express ourselves. Are those things at odds with one another? What do you think about that? Do you kind of think they are, or you kind of think they aren't? That seems like a big deal question to me. Is our, is our concern to make our community that everybody is equally respected and that we care about it when people get hurt by what we say, is that at odds with the goal of, look, we, gotta, we can't have people afraid to ask questions. We can't have people to say what they're thinking because that's how we try to figure out what we ought to think. Are those at odds? Or can we make a community right, that has both of those things? What do you think? You want to do like with every head bowed and every eye closed, let's say what we think about it? I don't know what to do. I, I don't, I just, I think, I, I just want to acknowledge the question and, and, and obviously I think it's an important question. Um, um, I hey, go. I think it's kind of important to, you know, tying in what she was said and what you said, I really agreed with some of what she said. Um, I think we need to examine the intention behind some of the questions that are being asked that are being classified as a microaggression. Okay. For example, if I were to ask somebody, uh, per se, another white male, um, where they were from at a college, they would probably say, granted that they're American, they'd probably say, oh, I'm from Wisconsin, or oh, I'm from Montana, or something like that. But, um, you know, and that's why I was kind of confused when I first read some of the things that were being called microaggressions. I was confused about why they were being called microaggressions. Asking somebody what state or town they're from, mm -hmm. as in where they're from, is a perfectly reasonable question. Um, and even if it is, you know, asking a question of what country are you from, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, some of those questions or some of those statements are them, are some, are people trying to become, are trying to become, you know, less racist, or trying to avoid these things. And I think what the reason that people are being hurt is that they're being reminded that there's a gap there. Okay. And I think we need to remember that the, I think some, this may be the case that you just have to edu educate people. I don't, so I don't think the gap is really anybody's fault. I think that it's a shared shared uh, task that we should do. I think we need to educate. Everybody needs to help educate everybody rather than just one specific group. Um, so yeah. Thank you. OK, thanks. Yes? Um, this may be a gross oversimplification, but I worked with bullying and violence prevention in elementary schools this past summer. Wait, say that again? I worked with bullying and violence prevention. Oh, I thought you said voting and violence <laughs> prevention. I was like, OK, sorry. Yeah, use the mic. Right off in your head. OK. Um, bullying and violence prevention. Yeah. Thank you. OK. In elementary schools. Okay. And a lot of what we found was actually that the victim, even if we change how much bullying is occurring in the schools, the victim will still feel victimized because that victimized mindset lingers for most of your life unless you actively work on it. Mm -hmm. It's a state of like learned helplessness that people acquire. And even if you change the outside influences, um, like this prevention program actually prevented a lot of the aggressors from causing more harm, but the victimized children still felt victimized mm -hmm. until we went in and talk to them about like hostile attribution bias. So like, for example, do you attribute these things as hostile or are you giving them the benefit of the doubt? Mm -hmm. And once they learned about those mindsets and the way they could shift their mindsets, mm -hmm. that's when they started to feel less victimized. Okay. okay, so this is a theme that has come up a couple of times and it came up, I think, think in Hyde's lecture uh, of going, going back to the uh, gentleman just spoke before this about the principle of charity or earlier on, right? We, we talk about giving the benefit of the doubt. I think that's probably what's behind this idea of the intention doesn't matter, right? I'll give you the benefit of the doubt that, that um, 
because because he wanted to say intentions do matter, right? He said that as the opposite way. But but one of the questions I think we might ask, and it, and I think it's been raised by some of the people here, is is whether we is whether we give the we first give the benefit of the doubt to ourselves, or whether we give the benefit of the doubt to others, right? And I'm reminded by by his third. I want to bring up his third point here, which hasn't I don't think been mentioned. Remember, the first one was about the weak, weak weakness, right? What you know. The, the, the idea of uh, making people weaker by protecting them. The second one being intentions, you know, that intentions really do matter. The third one, remember, he says, is that the line between good and evil runs through all of our hearts, right? And I, and I, and I I'll just, if I can talk about myself for a minute, what that makes me do is give myself the benefit of the doubt, right? Right? My intentions matter, so it must be okay. But, but, but what you're describing is giving the other person the benefit of the doubt is a way of opening up that conversation. But it also tells me something I can do in the situation, especially as a middle-aged white guy, professor, got the power, da-da-da, right? That, that, I, that I shouldn't be giving myself the benefit of the doubt. I should, it doesn't matter what my intentions are. If what I said hurt you, that's what matters. So that's one way, it seems to me, that we can combine two of his points to maybe move us down the road towards the kind of discussion that I do hear, maybe it's just because that's what I'm listening for, that I do hear saying, well, this is the kind of community we want to have here, where, where, where we together somehow or another are, are taking responsibility for this. Jamie, please, get me off the hook here. Me my, uh. Oh, okay, Matt, go, thank you. Um, so, oh, sorry. So, when I think about if there's anything that can or can't be shared in the classroom. I remember that I'm spending $50,000 to come here. Minus on average 62%. Keep going. Uh, ooh, okay. So that's a lot of money I feel like to just be dropping and not learning anything. Yeah. yeah. And so when I'm hearing about all these people that aren't expressing their opinions or sharing their ideas, I'm thinking about how much knowledge is just being lost okay. and how many perspectives just aren't being shared. And in some ways, I think that's absolutely sickening. Okay. And that okay. maybe this is an unfair criticism towards Luther, but I think it just doesn't do a good job in terms of building a community, just period. Okay. And I remember after the Height Lecture, I sat down in the CAF one day and I just had a conversation with an international student who was reading about this CHIPS article about how a person was expressing their sickness at something that Hyde had said and something that an experience that they had in class. And this person was saying, well, you know, I don't understand why, I understand why this person is, is feeling this way, but I also understand that this is a college and that we're gonna have uncomfortable experiences. Okay. And just reflect, reflecting on that conversation, I'm, I'm just thinking back to all four years that I've been here and how many situations where I've talked with fellow students, I've talked with fellow professors who said, I can't talk about this because it's not safe for me or it's not an opinion that I believe in. And in a lot of ways, I'm fed up with it. Okay. It's just, it's too much. We either need to be honest and say, this is what I mean, this is what I see, this is what I believe, and that's what we need. It, there's, there's too much hiding behind false, prim, false promises and okay. saying that, yeah. oh, I believe in this, but you, you really don't. And I think that now that Heights Lecture has kind of inspired that action. Okay. Thank you. Jamie, then we could keep That leads into my question, which just to add more questions when we have nine minutes left. Um, is who's, how do we create a culture? Like whose responsibility is that? I know that earlier you were like, is it something here, is it something up here? And you were wondering if. We've had a few conversations yeah, like, over there. <laughs> and you're talking about, you have, you're in an opportunity where you're in a position of power and it is your job to, not your, yeah, yeah, it's your job. Yeah, yeah um, probably. To foster and create a culture of exactly what Matt is talking about. And we talk about this quite a bit, is it, in, that is what the classroom is supposed to be, a place where you can exchange those ideas. But before we even get people to that forum of exchanging ideas and feeling comfortable exchanging their ideas, 
we have to somehow get everyone to do all these things that we've been referring to as like we need to be more empathetic. We need to be available to being vulnerable. We need to be acknowledging that this could cause potential pain in people. We need to be acknowledging the um, aggressor and the, like where they're coming from. We need to acknowledge potential ignorance. We need to acknowledge our own ignorance. We like all of these different things. So how do we go, and that leads back to even more types of education. You need to be educated to know that there's a potential that you're ignorant and you should probably be educated, right? So it's just creating this perpetual cycle that education and open-mindedness and education that you need to be open-minded is the key, but how do we go about doing that? And is it a top-down thing or is it a bottom-up thing or is it both? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you made an awesome point that a lot of people point to the administration and they're like, they need to start saying what bias is so we can call each other out for it so we have a clear distinction of what is okay to do and what's not okay to do. Okay, great, but then what happens amongst ourselves, right? So do we create rules that say, here are all the things that could potentially offend people, don't say them, or be aware that when you say them they could hurt somebody, right? That seems restrictive on our free speech. Or do we wait for all of these things to happen and then do all of, like teach people retroactively, okay, you're feeling victimized right now, here are some ways to cope with that but also to educate your aggressor so they don't do it again? Like, do we wait for it to happen and then educate, or do we try to prevent it from happening by educating, or is it a horrible cycle? Here are all my questions. Please answer them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jamie. Sorry for the rain. All right. Um, uh, I think that it's important to bear this in mind, and this sort of answers your question that you raised with the whole group earlier, um, to consider whether or not understanding is a prerequisite for empathy. Because the, the point earlier is, should the goal of the university be understanding, knowledge, knowledge and light, or should it be empathy, should it be uh, understanding and compassion? And I think those are both laudable goals for any institution to aspire to. I think by trying to jump straight to empathy and bypassing getting to it through understanding, uh, institutions jump the gun and mm -hmm. leave some people out of the loop. And leaving people out of, the, out of the loop creates a separation of distinction between this group over here okay. and everyone else. Okay, okay, thank you. Did you were, were you talking about my question? Yeah. I'll just say, I think I raised the question of whether those two things were at odds. Yes. And I and, think I, and I tried point. to refrain from offering any view on it, but anyway, yes. I, I think the serious question is, are they at odds? So I appreciate what you have to say. You're saying we've got to understand yes. in One order prerequisite for to, the other. thank you, thanks, thank you. Um, uh, what else do we have here? Is this, the, is this the place where I will invite Professor Chrisman to come down and uh, make a closing announcement? for the Center for Ethics and Public Engagement about more opportunities for, uh, for, for conversation? <laughs> or is there some other way in which we need to close this conversation? May maybe I could say in response to a couple of things that y'all have said, if you know what goes on in my classroom better than I do in a certain kind of a sense, I don't, don't, I'm not trying to speak for all the faculty in the room, but it sure would help me if you were able to tell me, right, well, what, this is how I could get more out of this class, right? This is how I could get more out of it, right? Whether it's I have stuff that I want to say and I feel like I can't, or whether it's like when other people, when other people speak, it makes me feel like I have no place here. Oh, I mean, there's all kinds of things that can go on in a classroom that can keep the, 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 the ideal conversation from happening. That conversation where we seek, where we try to figure out what, what's true together, right? In a free and mutually responsible and respectful way. There's all kinds of ways that can go wrong. It's the, it's, it's, it's one of the most amazing, it's why I love it so much. It's one of the most amazing things there is, right? What can happen in a college classroom when it's working in an ideal way. And if you tell us, right, 
This is what's not working for me. Maybe we can't do anything about it. Maybe we can, but, you, but we need you to do that. That's one concrete thing that you can do, right? Can I get a witness here for other faculty? Is that all right? Is that, you know? Okay. So, there, so there's, there's one thing, uh, gesturing towards uh, our life together in our community. But really, in, honor, in order to respect your time, let me say again, as uh, Professor Christman is coming down um, with the microphone, uh, um, let me thank you again, um, uh, those, who, those who spoke, those who spoke many times, those who spoke once, those who came uh, to listen and to think and to not speak at all. Thank you for being here, and, and I hope that you will take this conversation to those who weren't here in a way that, in a way that moves this place towards being a better place, being a better college for everybody. So thank you. Thank you for that. I have some thanks in a minute too. Before we get to those, um, I was not planning on coming down here, so I hope I can remember the information Storm thinks I should convey. But I think that what that is, is that for those of you who, especially those of you who have called for a safe space to have dialogue, a place where all voices can be heard, we, we are working on that. And one of the ways in which we're working on it is that we are offering a day of better angels Dialogue, And this is a group that has sprung up after the last election to teach people who lean left and people who lean right to speak to each other and to be less polarized but listen to each other. And so some of us at the Center for Ethics got, supposedly got trained in how to moderate such a discussion. We'll see how that training went. <laughs> but we have the founder of the group, of the Better Angels group. His name is... Um, Bill Doherty, he's from Minnesota, and he's going to come on the 1st of December. And he's going to run a couple of workshops for us, and he's going to do a skills workshop to help teach us, believe it or not, how to talk to each other, <laughs> which we shouldn't probably need to learn, but we do. And so if you are interested in that, like how bad can it be to pick up some skills, right? <laughs> it's open to everyone. And so please contact us at cepe at luther.edu, and we'll get your name on the list. It's the afternoon of Saturday, the 1st of December. It'll be in the bulletin, it is in the bulletin, and Tuesday, um, and it's open to everyone. So put that on your calendar. And also, please join me in thanking Storm Bailey, who is such a good sport and did such a great job. Thanks. Thank you. Okay.